Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health, lessons from our tradition. And we are honored to have our esteemed uh, speakers with us tonight. Uh, first up, we have um, our beloved brother, Ustad uh, Babadi Bahir. Um, he's an associate clinical social worker and a registered alcohol and drug technician in California. And he works as a therapist and substance abuse counselor with Tayba Foundation and the Thuil Center. Um, he has a master's of clinical social work. Um, he also serves as uh, one of our university chaplains at uh, Cal State University, San Bernardino. Um, he has a lot of experience, mashallah. All right, two decades of experience counseling, mentoring, and teaching the incarcerated, uh, the formerly incarcerated and inner city populations. And he is also a student <coughs> of uh, sacred knowledge. Uh, he has been, mashallah, with IOK for a while now, alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, and then we also have uh, one of our um, IOK seminary students, uh, sister, uh, Kuma Wanja, uh, who also is a uh, research assistant for the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. And I believe she has a gap year, so she's taking advantage of her gap year and studying Arabic and Islamic studies in the seminary. And uh, she will be, inshallah, a future medical school student. So <laughs> make dua. Uh, but without any further ado, we'll get started, inshallah. Okay, oh, here we go. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa afdulu salatu taslim Ala Sayyid al-Anbiya iwar mursaleen <coughs> Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Mustafa Al-Ameen Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Allahumma anfa'una bima alimtana wa alimna ma yunfa'una wa zidna ilma Walhamdulillahi ala kulli hal Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alintana in a cantal alimu hakim, Mohammed in the Audu become a dilla odel, our zilla ozel, our idolima udlama, achala yuchala alea. So I think we've been given about an hour for this presentation. So I'm going to go kind of quickly so that uh, I can try to give you a summary without diminishing the magnitude of this topic. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to start off with a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's narrated by Abu Umama radiallahu an. And he narrates that a young man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he asked literally he asked I'm not going to read the Arabic just to uh, you know to go quickly but he literally asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for permission to commit zina. Okay, so this is, you know, intimacy with the opposite gender without being married. He's asking Rasulullah for permission for this. And so the people around Rasulullah, they started, you know, telling him, meh, meh, you know, uskut, shut up, man, right, shut up. And what did Rasulullah do? Please pay attention, because these are the times that we're living in. We're living in times where you're going to hear about this more and more, okay? So even though the people were saying, be quiet, Rasulullah told him, come here, come here. And so he came close to Rasulullah and then Rasulullah, he told him, sit down. And then he began to ask him a couple of questions. He said, would you like that for your mother? And the response was, La wallah. He said, La wallahi. And then he said something that they, that they say in Arabic to express the love that they have for Rasulullah. And he said, May I be sacrificed for you. And then Rasulullah said, Would you like that for your daughter? Again, No, wallahi. May I be sacrificed for you. And then he went on to ask him. Uh, he, then he said, people don't like that for their mothers. And people don't like that for their daughters. And then he went on to ask him, would you like that for your sister? He said, la wallah, may I be sacrificed for you. Rasulullah Islam said, people are like that. They don't want it for their sisters. And then he said, would you like that for your aunts? 
And in Arabic, you know, the aunts is on the masculine side, on the feminine side. He asked them about both. He said, La wallah. So at the end, Rasulullah said, neither would people like that for their aunts. Rasulullah placed his hand on him. And then he said, Oh Allah, forgive him his sins, purify his heart, and guard his chastity. In another narration, the young man says that when he left uh, the company of Rasulullah he actually saw a young lady that he used to court and play the game with. And she called him, and he, he didn't go. And uh, he went on to say, before I went into the presence of Rasulullah Zina was the most beloved thing to me. And when I left the presence of Rasulullah it became the most hated thing to me. When a therapist or a counselor who's trained reads this hadith, they should understand, they, they should very quickly be able to relate to exactly what happened here from a psychological point of view. Number one, notice that Rasulullah brought him near. Okay? He brought him to himself. All right? And this is what we do in therapy. The first thing, the first couple of sessions, you just want to get to know the person. And then you begin to ask him a series of questions. We call this motivational interviewing. All right? Motivational interviewing is to cause the change within the person. Why is that important? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi kawmin, hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah doesn't change the condition of people until they change what is in their own selves. So it's what the counselor has to do is try to get him to change. You don't make it a lecture session, but you ask him questions to make him realize you have to change. And this is what Rasulullah is doing. He's asking him simple questions. He didn't, he didn't do any spiritual bypassing. Oh, you need to pray? How can you ask me that? I am the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Don't you see the ayat in the Quran where it says, Wala taqribu zina? He didn't do that. He came down to the level of the person and he dealt with him where he was. And this is what we are trained to do as therapists. And this is what Muslims have done for almost a thousand years. And we'll talk more about that. Another thing that we do in therapy is we create what's called a therapeutic bond. Right? Nobody wants to hear what you have to say until you are important to them or they are important to you. Right? Everybody loves chocolate. Nobody wants it shoved down their throat. So this is what Rasulullah did. He created a bond between him and the young man so that the young man would be receptive to what he was saying. Okay? We call this supportive intervention. Where you're just listening to the person and you are establishing a rapport. He understands you or she understands you and you understand them. So, I just wanted to start with that. How do we? Okay, bismillah. <coughs> yeah, we did that, all right? <laughs> okay, Islamic psychology. What is Islamic psychology? So as it says here, It is an approach to the study and understanding of human psychology, right? Understanding human beings. As a matter of fact, even in Western civilization, they understood before, you know, modern times, they understood that the human being had a soul. In Greek, this word psych psychology, the psyche in Greek means soul. And then ology means the study of. 
So biology, psychology, the study of biology, uh, the study of the, the bio of a person, or the study of the psyche of a person. Originally, that's what it meant. And in Arabic, they used to call it ilm uh, nafs You know, there were a few other words. But this was something that Muslims knew, they understood, and they practiced. Okay? So, now our study and understanding of human psychology is informed by a vast body of knowledge which has come to us from the Quran and the prophetic tradition, which includes hadith, the seerah of Rasulullah wasalam, you know, all of that literature. Okay? Okay. Actually, yeah, we can leave it there. Uh, a little bit more about human psychology. Uh, what we try to understand, okay, as therapists, especially Islamic therapists, we want to know what's driving the behavior. What's driving the behavior? So we understand that a person has beliefs. We understand that a person has thoughts, that a person has impulses, that their character, you know, they have a character which is affected by their social situation, how they were raised, where they're going to school, their family situation, their family structure, all right? Their purpose, their relationship with Allah. And included in that is Self-development, you might hear it called teskiya, you know, this development of the human being spiritually. All of that is included in Islamic psychology. So as it says here, this is our paradigm. In other words, this is our model. Everything needs a model. MashaAllah, we are here in the esteemed IOK. And wallahi, I love this place. Uh, in 2016, when I first came here, I knew this was the place. And mashallah, my daughter goes here and she's a student of knowledge. I myself studied here. I love the teachers. I love the structure. But they have a model that they teach by. Right? They don't just throw things together and then start teaching. They have a model. And that model is based on the hadith of Jibril. Right? Every Islamic institution is going to have that as, you right, like Iman, Islam, uh, Ihsan. Right, and al sa'a the belief system, every, every, you know, th anything worthy that you're going to teach, it has to have a model that is based upon. This is what our model is based upon. That the human being consists of two bodies. He's physical, but he's also spiritual, right? We come here to this realm, and we forget about our spiritual selves, and sometimes part of the therapeutic, uh, uh, the therapeutic engagement is helping the person to remember no 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 you're spiritual before you are physical right what did Allah say in the Quran that he extracted all of the souls all of the souls that would ever be from Adam alayhi salam and he asked them a question alastu bi rabbikum this happened in the spiritual realm this happened in the spiritual realm when we come here, we forget, but that's what we have dhikr, all the different types of dhikr, including recitation of Quran, so that you can remember. So we are physical, but we're also spiritual. Number two, the human spiritual existence is before birth, and it goes on after death. All right? That the Muslim classical scholars, they mapped the human psyche. They mapped it. And they used the model which incorporated these terms, the understanding of these terms. The very first thing is that there's a fitra. Every human being, he has a stamp on his soul. And he has the ability and the potential to recognize truth. And the highest truth is, no. La ilaha illallah. You have to know there's nothing worthy of worship except Allah. Okay? Um, so that's the fitra. We also have a nafs. We have a nafs, right? We have uh, behind these eyes is, a, is another person 
who speaks and, and makes suggestions to us, right? This nafs, the center of that nafs is called the qalb or the heart. And this is the only thing that's going to benefit you, yawm al qiyamah. What, did, what does the Quran say? يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُوا مَالٍ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَطَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Nothing will benefit you except on the Day of Judgment, not your wealth, مَالٍ وَلَا بَنُونَ Not your family, not your status. Only those who come to Allah with a sound heart. What is a sound heart? It's free from spiritual defects. This is what the scholars over a thousand years, 1400 years, we've been working on. This is what Islamic psychology is. The aql, the aql is, is a lot of times is translated as the intellect. But you should know that the human being has two types of intellect. The human being has, you know, the, the brain. It's, you know, it calculates sensory input. It divides it and tells you, oh, something's coming at you very quickly. Something is, uh, did you hear something? Did you smell something? Did you taste something? Did you see something? Right? Did you touch something? This is what the brain is busy doing now. Your brain right now is busy listening to me. Okay? You're, you're, you're assessing the information. You're bringing it in. You're, you're processing it. But the heart has its own intellect. It has its own intellect. And it processes spiritual meanings. Okay, spiritual meanings, ultimate meanings, like what's going to happen to you when you die? This is a very serious question. And I have people that come into my office that as they start to get older and they don't know what's going to happen to them when they die because they're non-Muslim. They haven't given it much thought. They don't know. They begin to panic. They begin to have existential issues, all right? And so, alhamdulillah, we have been given more information about what happens when you die than any other community. And so the, the Muslims, they took this information and they, they added it to the psyche. Tell me when to stop talking. The ruh, right, the soul. Okay, the soul, uh, if there's no soul in the human being, he won't have any life. Okay, and then the mir, the conscience. You know, all of these things are, uh, you know, what the classical scholars mapped. So when we are sitting in front of someone and we are having a, uh, you know, a, a therapeutic session, we take all of this into consideration as you're having the conversation. We take all of this into consideration, all right? As opposed to the Western paradigm, the Western model, starting in about the 1700s, they completely removed the soul from, you know, the, 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 the psychological paradigm, the psychological model. They completely removed it. I went through their program. I have different certificates and diplomas in that program. They don't add it, right? They don't, they, you better not bring up the soul. Don't bring it up. Don't talk about it. And alhamdulillah, now a lot of even the non-Muslim therapists are, um, are beginning to add you know, more concepts from religion as they, as they give therapy. Alhamdulillah, this is, this is starting to happen. Uh, so the human being, the, you know, the, in the Western paradigm, the human being evolved from lower species. Right? So your great, 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 great grandfather was a monkey. Right? I mean, this is what they say. Or worse, right? He was a reptile or a fish or something. Na'udhu billah. Right? We are Bani Adam. Our father is Adam alayhi salam. Okay? They also have in the Western paradigm that the human being is only consists of what can be seen and measured. Right? They're spending a lot of time mapping the mind, uh, mapping the brain. 
You know, and uh, you know, alhamdulillah, there's some benefit. There's some benefit there, no doubt. And like Rasulullah Islam said, al hikmatu dalat al Muslim, dalat al Mu'min, that the, that you know, any type of wisdom is the lost property of a of, of a believer. So we go and we find it. Okay, we 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 chase after it. Uh, but you know, they're very busy mapping the nervous system. You know, mapping the hormones and those things. But if you speak about the soul, you know, you are you you might fail that class, right? Um, and then outward behavior. And that the center of the human being, and this is crucial, this is very, very crucial. And this is the reason why a lot of times when you see pictures of uh, mental health and things like that, it's always the brain. Because that is the center of the human being, according to the Western paradigm. All right? The Islamic paradigm, the center of the human being, his heart. Qalb. Right? Like, not the thing that's... The, the, the thing that's beating, the outward heart, but within it, it contains psycho-spiritual material that's affected by sins. And it grows when you do good deeds. And it needs purification. Okay? And that's where we come from as Muslim psychologists, Muslim therapists, Muslim counselors. Okay, next slide. All right. So what is the goal? of Islamic psychology. It's holistic treatment, okay? Holistic treatment, which takes into consideration that the human being is biological. He has a body, and it has rights over you. Right, read the thick material, you'll understand, okay? Um, your body has rights over you. We take this into consideration, that you're also psychological, you have a psyche, you have this whole inner world that's going on that I just described about the fitra and the nafs and the qalb and the ruh, right? All of that, the aql. You have all of that going on. You have emotions, all right? That cognition that I was talking about. You have a whole, you know, spiritual realm inside of you, each and every one of us. But you are also sociological, right? Like, mashallah, that's why we're here. We're part of this community, this beautiful community. And we're affected by what happens in the community. You have to take that into consideration. It doesn't matter where a person is from, they are affected by that. Okay? And that has to be part of the therapeutic process. But also, the human being is also spiritual. He's also spiritual. He has a soul. And that his origin is from the divine realm. We're just here for a moment. Right? We came from a whole nother realm. All right? All of us said, when Allah asked, uh, asked all of us, Alastu bi rabbikum? We all said, Bala shahidna. Of course, we bear witness. Every single human being bore witness that Allah was their Lord. So when you're here, don't forget that. Allah is your Lord. You're going to have other people that's going to be like Fir'aun, or it might be yourself. It might be yourself. Yourself will tell you. Just like Fir'aun said to Musa and all the people of Egypt, Ana rabbukum al -a I am your Lord Most High. No. Allah is your Lord Most High. And this is what we take into consideration in that uh, process. Okay. All right. This is a long topic right here, right? Just the, his, the history of Islamic psychology. But just to summarize, you should know, we have over a thousand years, not of just medical science and making some of the most advanced discoveries. Uh, just to give you an example, you know cataracts? You know, Muslims were the, f the first ones to do cataract surgery. They invented the needle that was able to extract the cataracts from the eye. The Muslims. That's at a medical level. But what we don't talk about many times is that at a psychological level, we were also made huge advances in curing the nafs of people. Okay? Using this wisdom, like the first hadith I gave you, Using this wisdom from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, okay, to uh, uh, to help people. 
The first hospital that was built by Muslims, this is only about 75 years after Rasulullah passed away. 75 years we had a hospital built in Damascus. Okay? And it wasn't, uh, you know, hidden away. This hospital was in the center of town, very close to the masjid, so that everyone could have access to it. And treatment was free. All right? And they added the psychological components. So they put gardens in it and around it because greenery has an effect on us. Right? Hearing the birds chirp in the morning, so they put a garden there. So hearing the birds chirp in the morning, you know, it, it does something to the, to the patient. It helps them. And so they added all of these things and made it accessible to everyone. You know, there were women doctors who were responsible for treating the women patients. And there were men doctors who were responsible for uh, treating the men patients. This had to do with medical treatment and psychological treatment. Okay? These are some important figures in Islamic uh, uh, psychology. I don't want you to think that I'm uh, just shooting from the hip here. All right? Um, so Ali ibn Sahal, Rabban at Tabari. Uh, as you can see, this is very early on, 838. Very early on, um, in his book, he had a book, it was called Firdaus al-Hikmah. Firdaus al-Hikmah. And he says in that book that people can get sick psychologically just based upon their imagination. What they imagine is going on. And everybody in here who has brothers and sisters and spouses, we know how that goes, right? Sometimes your spouse will say, no, you said this. You say, no, I didn't say that. And a whole issue can come from an imagination. This is what he's talking about. All right? That sometimes just the way we think can cause us problems. And it's the job of what he called the wise counselor to come in and give you wisdom. In other words, have a therapeutic session and help you to overcome that. Okay? This is, you know, more than a thousand years ago. And then the next one, Abu Zayd al-Balqi. I have his book right here. One of his books, uh, the second one there. Abu Zayd al-Balqi, right? Almost a thousand years ago, he wrote this, right? This is the English translation, Abu Zayd al-Balqi. And in it, he's talking about you know, the, the, the psychological issues that happen with human beings. And he divides them up into four categories, like anger and aggression. Like what happens when a person is, uh, has anger? Sometimes anger is not, you know, direct, right? It's what we call passive aggression. He talks about that in here. Over a thousand years ago, if a person is not able to express his anger, not able to get it out, he'll have this passive anger where he makes smart comments. And he says he needs to be with a counselor, someone who can help him to overcome that. So he talks about that. He talks about sadness and depression, obsessions like OCD. Oh, a thousand years ago, people. This is part of our heritage. Okay? And... Fear and anxiety. And you should know that the two most common, uh, you know, uh, psychological issues that happen with human beings is exactly that. Some type of anxiety and some type of depression. Okay? It's very natural. This is the reason why Rasulullah used to say, it was part of his morning program, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal hazan. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from grief and anxiety. He used to say this. It was, it's part of a longer uh, dua, but he used to say this because this is something very common to human beings. And so what the scholars are doing is they are elaborating on our states and telling us how to overcome it. Okay? Uh, Sheikh Farhan, how much time do we have? <laughs> Keep going. Okay. All right. Uh, Abu Bakr Muhammad Ibn Zakariya Ar-Razi 
Same thing. Um, you know, he talks about, um, he, was a, he was a master at what we call psychosomatic, um, psychosomatic uh, disorders. And he gives a case in one of his books where, you know, uh, there was a young lady and she was depressed. She was very depressed and the family was bringing the doctors and saying, what, uh, you know, what's wrong with her? And they couldn't give a biological diagnosis because there was nothing wrong with her. Even though she was in, I mean, she was like, de she had debilitating depression. So she's in the bed as if she has a biological illness. So when he, it finally came around to him, he started doing some research about her and he found out that she was actually in love. And that the, the one that she was in love with had died. So he began, he had, he took her, her, her uh, pulse here and he began to ask her questions about the beloved. And her pulse began to quicken. And he knew instantly, this is psychosomatic. She has a psychological issue going on and it's causing the physical illness. There's a lot of research on this now. A lot of research on this. Where people experience trauma in their lives, they never process it, they never overcome it, and they develop cancer from it. Wallahi, study after study after study, people are finding this. This brother here, Abu Bakr Muhammad Ibn Zakaria al-Razi, he knew this almost a thousand years ago. Okay? And then of course, uh, Ibn Miskawe, he has a book, uh, you know, talks a little bit, you know, about, um, you know, purifying the self and understanding the different divisions of the self. Tahdib uh, al uh, Tahdib al-Aqlaq, I believe it's called. Um, and then, of course, the infamous uh, Imam Ghazali. I don't think I need to say anything about Imam Ghazali. Everyone should know. Right? Like he's the master of all the Islamic sciences. But he was also, you know, he, he indicated this, you know, like how to deal with human beings. Just how to deal with them. Okay? All right. I'm trying to, I, only, I think I only have two more slides left. And then I'll be out of your way. All right. So, um, what the first hadith that I talked about was what we would call supportive intervention, where Rasulullah someone's coming to Rasulullah and he has something going on with him, right? He has something going on with him. He's in love with his nafs. So much so, he goes to Rasulullah and he asks permission for zina. This is what Rasulullah gave him. This is what we call supportive interventions, where he's giving general counsel. And that's the first thing, he's present with him. That's why he called him to him. He didn't answer his question from far away. He, he brought him near to him to be in his presence. Right? And that was the sunnah of Rasulullah right? that when he used to talk to someone, he didn't just turn his head, but he would turn his whole body so that he would be present with the person. And we know that this is effective in uh, psychological counseling. You give all your undivided attention to the one that you're speaking to. All right? You watch everything. Even if they lick their lips, there might be something there. He might be thirsty, right? Go get them some water, okay? You have to have active listening, right? You're catching all the cues. You're not looking at your phone. You're not, uh, you know, busy with something else. You're catching all of the cues. And then you have empathy. You know, empathy is to be able to put yourself in their shoes. This is what Rasulullah was telling the young man. He said, don't, don't you, do you have a, a, a mother? Would you like that? For, for someone to do that with your mother? No. See, he took the young man and he put them in someone else's shoes. That's empathy. And then he corrected without condemning. Right? This is something that we, we should take a lesson from. You have to deal with people where they are. Wherever they are, that's where you deal with them. Okay? Now, what about these specialized interventions? Specialized interventions is like what you would do when uh, somebody has, you know, therapy, um, trauma. When somebody has trauma. Now, somebody can have physical trauma. There's all different types of trauma, right? Somebody can have physical trauma. Something happened to them, you know, uh, you know, and... Uh, 
you know, in any time that situation seems like it's going to present itself. Let me give you an example. You get robbed at gunpoint at a gas station and the guy had on a red jacket. So now you're walking in the mall, you see somebody with a red jacket, your nervous system goes off and says, run, right? So you're having a traumatic reaction, even though there's no harm present, okay? Uh, so for that, you might have to do what we call some psychoeducation. You have to explain to the person what's going on, help them to understand, and then you do some reframing. You know, in other words, um, Allah does this in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we're at IOK, and there's a lot of hufad here, right? So we've got to get this right. But in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, um, perhaps you like something which is bad for you. And you dislike that which is good for you. Allah knows and you don't know. Right? This is reframing. This is showing you something that may not be what it appears. And many times you have to do that with people who have experienced trauma. Right? You help them to see that they could possibly benefit when they overcome the trauma. This is, you can understand this directly from the Quran. Directly from the Quran. Now, when has anyone had trauma? Anybody had trauma? From the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Who, who, who had trauma? When, when can you imagine that the Muslims were like, oh my God, what just happened to us? Anyone? Hmm? Who said it? MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan. The Battle of Uhud. The Battle of Uhud, it took a toll on the Muslims, boy. All right? And Allah addressed it. Allah addressed it over and over again in the Quran. All right? And just to save time, all right, I'm going to kind of go through this very quickly. All right? Um, so I'll start with this one where he's explaining to them. Um, he says, you know, do not grieve. Right? Uh, do not lose heart and do not grieve. After the battle of Uhud, there was over 70 brothers that were lost during the battle of Uhud. Right? They're with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so they never thought that they would lose. So to lose, that's trauma. That's traumatic. And so Allah is telling them, don't lose heart. And don't grieve, right? You know, you have to gain mastery if you have true faith, okay? But he also educates them. He tells them what they did wrong too, right? There's many, many verses. I just want to, you know, just touch on this a little bit, right? And I'm, I'm segmenting into another what um, our sister here is getting ready to talk about, um, what I, the point I want to make here is this. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not do, He didn't tell them that they needed to pray more. He did not tell them that they needed to read more Quran. He addressed the issue, but He also encouraged them. Right? Don't lose heart. Don't grieve. You know, you have, you're the uppermost. At the same time where he's telling them, you know, you're going to be okay. So in this next verse, he tells them, you know, uh, he says, uh, after the excitement of the distress, he sent down calm on, the band, on a band of you, overcome with slumber, while another band was stirred to anxiety by their own feelings. Remember who we're talking about. These are the companions of Rasulullah and Allah is addressing them. This trauma that you had, I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on. He's saying they, have, they feel anxiety. And then he says they were moved by wrong suspicions of Allah. Right? Suspicions due to ignorance. And they said, what affair is this of ours? This is a traumatic response. Right? You're trying to make sense of what happened. 
And so you're just, you're just grasping for whatever comes. And so Allah is spelling it out. Sometimes this is what happens when people are traumatized. This is what happens. But then he tells Rasulullah how to be with them. And I'll end with this. He tells Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this is right after the battle of Uhud. What happened with them after the battle? Of, like, why did the Muslims lose? Because they didn't obey. They didn't obey. Rasulullah sallallahu told them, uh, some of the archers, stay here, don't move. No matter what happens, don't, do, don't, don't move. They moved. And so Allah wanted to teach them discipline. And sometimes that's what people come to us for as therapists. They come to us, like, I can't control myself. Help me. Teach me the way. To, how do I control myself? This is what Allah is doing. And Uhud never happened again because they learned that lesson. Okay? So Allah is giving them discipline. And we extract all of this as therapists. We extract it and say, okay, this is what we have to do. So he told Rasulullah how to deal with them. He said, and we have the whole father here. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةً مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَتُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكِ It is by the mercy of Allah that you are gentle with them. لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا If you were harsh, غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ Hard-hearted, they would just flee from around you. You see? They disobeyed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It caused them to lose 70 people. They were traumatized. Allah caused it anxiety. He tells them, don't lose heart. Don't grieve. And then he tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa be gentle with them. This is the therapeutic process. This is what we have been doing for over 1400 years. Okay, as Islamic psychologists, therapists. One more statement. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, uh, one of the, you know, um, one of the uh, things that we have to do as therapists, when we do an assessment, we want to remove what may be a biological condition first. Somebody may come to you and they have depression. It's your duty to make sure that it's not caused by something biological. And it does them no good to say, you need to increase your faith. You need to pray more. That's just a sign of your incompetence if you don't know the situation. So we spend time with them, trying to get, them to, trying to, get to understand them. All right? Um, you know, and it reminds me of a hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu an, when he said that sometimes they would be so hungry in the sufa. He was speaking about himself. They would be so hungry he would pass out. But one of the customs of the Arabs was that they would come and they would put their foot on the neck of the person who passed out because they automatically assumed that he was majnoon. And then he would come out of it and say, I'm not majnoon, I'm just hungry. Right? So you have to remove the condition that's most apparent first. It might be biological. It might be sociological. Right? You remove those first before you say, let's work on your iman. And I'll pass it over to my sister. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Jazakallah, Ustad Tabri, for a very insightful, um, you know, conversation on Islamic psychology. And I just want to take a second to thank you all for being so patient. And I request that you continue to be a little bit more patient as we uh, finish off the talk. And so now we're going to be segueing into Muslim mental health, which is a little bit different than Islamic psychology. So in this conversation, we're going to be touching on general information and facts around Muslim mental health, what different psychological disorders look like, and most importantly, what tools exist, how to access different resources, um, and, and, and more. And also just thank you all for coming out here today. It's really nice to see such a big crowd. Um, and it's really nice to know that we can have a conversation around mental well-being and Islamic psychology here at IOK. So JazakAllah khair and uh, kindly request you guys to continue to stay a little bit more patient, inshallah. 
So let's first talk about a couple of common misconceptions that maybe you guys have heard, you know, through social media or just, you know, just you hear this, right? The idea that Muslims don't experience mental health challenges. Muslims are immune from mental health challenges. They don't struggle with psychological disorders such as depression, anxiety, OCD, schizophrenia. It's almost thought of as, this is a them problem. This doesn't happen to us as Muslims. So not only is this statement factually incorrect, but it's also extremely harmful in the sense that it isolates a lot of the Muslims in our very own communities who struggle with these challenges. It makes them feel alone and helpless. It riddles them with shame and guilt. And so, you know, essentially what we're doing is when we continue to perpetuate myths like this, when we continue to not acknowledge the reality of the situation, which is the fact that Muslims globally are struggling with different mental disorders. So when we are not accepting that, when we are not addressing that, what happens? There are a bunch of consequences. You have Muslims hiding their mental health struggles. You have Muslims not reaching out for help. You have a lack of investment into resources uh, for Muslims. You have a lack of investment into research uh, for Muslims. And essentially, it creates an environment. It creates a culture within our own communities of stigma, of shame. It's embarrassing to struggle. But they're just human emotions, right? So it's really important for us to realize that these myths are incorrect. These misconceptions are incorrect. So let's take a moment and let's look at the facts. This is a pretty popular study done by the American Psychiatric Association published in 2018, uh, where they found that Muslims do report high rates of disorders such as anxiety and mood disorders, around 15 to 20%, as well as adjustment disorders, around 30 to 40%. You have other smaller studies, uh, not, not smaller studies, you just have other studies done on different samples across the globe that consistently are showing that Muslims are in fact struggling with mental health. They're showing that the most common conditions that Muslims report are anxiety and depression. They're showing that post 9-11, Muslims are more likely to consult their religious leaders and their, and, uh, and their imams at masjids asking for uh, essentially just help, right? So you see that this stuff is uh, going on and uh, now we want to look at maybe why is this happening, right? We might not have exact rates on, you know, the entire Muslim population and their entire rates of, and their exact rates of anxiety or depression, but we can look at a couple of other factors. So this is another statistic published by the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, showing that about 60% of Muslim Americans reported religious discrimination in America. It is no surprise that we as Muslims in America face some sort of discrimination, whether that be religious discrimination, whether that be racial discrimination. We as Muslims do have unique challenges that we face, especially in a post 9-11 society, especially with the different politics that are going around, right? And there are countless studies that are showing the link between experiencing discrimination, experiencing a lack of feeling like you belong in a place, and it's linked to worse health outcomes, it's linked to lower life expectancy, it's linked to lower well-being. So we, don't, we might not know all the estimates of the rates uh, uh, that Muslims are struggling, but we do realize that Muslims are facing unique challenges that put them at a greater risk if not equal risk of being susceptible to certain mental uh, health challenges and disorders. So that's something that's really important to recognize. And lastly, I wanna bring up that we, don't, we, we can just look directly to our tradition when we are faced with a misconception like this, right? When we hear things like Muslims don't experience mental health challenges, they're not struggling. Let's just look back to our own Prophet Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are all probably familiar with the year of sorrow, Amm al -Huzn. This is a year that he lost his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anh. Shortly after, he lost his uncle Abu Talib. Uh, Khadija radiallahu anh, she was his supporter, she was uh, his wife, the one that comforted him and believed in him when he first received revelation. Imagine losing someone like that, and then right after, losing the uncle who was his main protector. And then in that same year, going to the village of Ta'if, being humiliated, being pelted, having stones pelted at him, um, and experiencing that kind of trauma simply because of Need, wanting to spread the religion of Islam. So you can see that so many of these really intense moments happened in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life in that year. 
And scholars know how difficult of a year that was for him, how much sorrow and grief and sadness he experienced, right? Another example, uh, you know, Prophet Yaqub alayhi wasalam, when he was separated from his son, Prophet Yusuf alayhi wasalam, scholars note that his eyes went white with grief and he was filled with sorrow. That's how much of an immense sense of grief that he felt, right? And when we think about this, our, our Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Yaqub, these are the best of best of creations. They're close to perfection. They're the ones that Allah loved, them, Allah loved the most. So if they're struggling with mental health, if, if they're struggling with essentially you know, emotional challenges, if they're struggling with hardships, if they're experiencing grief, sorrow, pain, how can we, you and I, ordinary human beings, not struggle, not suffer, not experience these challenges? So the next time that you are faced with these misconceptions, it's our duty to counteract them and to look back into our tradition. We don't need to go searching for examples anywhere else. We have our own examples from our history. We, we realize that prophets faced immense sadness and they were the best of creations. So it's only natural that we as Muslims will experience you know, immense difficulties and emotional challenges from time to time. Now, another myth or misconception that gets thrown around a lot and is also very, very harmful is the idea that struggling with mental health challenges such as anxiety or depression is a sign of weak faith and or personality flaws such as weakness and whatnot. Uh, Ustad Tabari covered this a little bit in one of his slides. Um, and so this is also very, very uh, harmful. So we don't doubt that you know, spirituality is linked to mental well-being, right? We understand that the way that we perceive and deal with our mental emotions is intrinsically linked to our spirituality. But we're not saying that religiosity and your level of religiosity dictates your mental well-being. We're not saying that if you have lower levels of religiosity, you will struggle more with mental health. Or because you are struggling with mental health, that's because you are not praying enough. Or because you have a weak sense of um, amen. That's not what we're saying. And that's something that we should stay away from saying. Because you know, ultimately, mental health challenges, and they're very complex. Psychological disorders, they're very complex. Physicians and scientists are still trying to figure out what causes all, a lot of these things. They are caused by a myriad of factors. They're caused by your genetics, your environment, the household you were raised in, your socioeconomic status, the fact that if you have access to resources like healthcare or not, right? So it's really an oversimplification and an incorrect oversimplification to say that you are struggling with anxiety or depression because you lack Iman. You are struggling because you don't pray enough. You are struggling because you don't recite Quran enough. That's not how it works. Uh, and I think Asad Dabri also, you know, explained this a little bit in his slides as well. And once again, we're going back to our tradition. We're trying to understand how to deconstruct these myths from our tradition. And I really, I found this, and I really loved this uh, in in context of this slide. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam teaches us: when Allah subhanahu wa taala desires good for someone, He tries them with hardships. So let's read that again. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires good for someone, meaning he loves them, he wants good for them, he tries them with hardships and challenges. Now I want you to go back up and look at the myth. Struggling with mental health challenges such as anxiety or depression is a sign of weak iman, right? And so when we, when we see this hadith, when we see this prophetic teaching, we realize that the first myth doesn't stand a chance. Struggling, if whether that be dealing with emotional challenges or psychological disorders, may be a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he loves us. He's testing us because he wants to you know, test our faith and, uh, and that's why he's bringing these challenges um, you know, to us. So it's just a little bit of cognitive reframing. Instead of saying, I'm struggling because I'm not praying enough, we can try saying, I'm struggling because Allah loves me and Allah, I know that if Allah loves me, he is going to test me, right? So once again, we don't need to go hunting for like different, in, 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 even in Western psychology, trying to find ways to like uh, deconstruct these myths. We just need to go back into our Quran and Sunnah and realize that these messages are there uh, and really just try to apply them. The last myth that we're gonna cover is, there is no hope for Muslims struggling with mental health challenges and they will never recover. Surprisingly, that is something that is said a lot. It's something that you know, is thrown around a lot. You have anxiety, you have depression, you're done. You're not gonna heal, you're not gonna recover, you're gonna be like this forever. Once again, very inaccurate and very harmful because imagine someone who is already struggling and you tell them you're not gonna recover. How are they going to feel? First of all, they're probably not going to go even try to access help anymore. They're probably not going to even try to get resources anymore. So understanding that this statement is 
very inaccurate and doing our best and our due diligence to counteract them in situations is really important. So let's look at the facts. Mental health challenges can be managed through lifestyle changes and there are a range of treatment modalities that exist. So let's talk about those lifestyle changes. Whether it's thinking about your diet, your exercise, your sleep, you know, am I eating foods that are nourishing me? Am I sleeping enough to wake up the next morning and feel calm and be able to take on, you know, my, my daily responsibilities? Am I exercising and taking care of my physical health? These are ways that we can, you know, change, tweak a little bit in our everyday lifestyles to make sure that we are just maintaining a healthy mental well-being, that we are in a state of like calmness and being able to get through the day. Uh, so when someone says you can't recover or there's no hope for you, there is. There are little switches that we can make in our daily lifestyle uh, and, and other things. You know, do I have family and friends that support me? Do I have family and friends that love me, care for me? Am I surrounding myself um, around good influences? Am I surrounding myself from people who encourage me to be better, who help me grow? Studies show that having a strong support system is a resiliency factor against mental health, uh, against, you know, uh, mental well-being and developing um, psychological disorders, right? Am I enjoying hobbies? Am I taking time out to do things that rejuvenate me, whether that be playing with my kids, hanging out with my friends, family, spouse, playing sports? Am I doing all of these things, right? Am I engaging in dhikr? Am I engaging in salah? Am I connecting with Allah during my salah? Am I connecting while I'm reading Quran? That is one of the most powerful tools of the believer, right? Using using uh, these these things to manage our um, you know to manage our emotional challenges on an everyday basis. And to the second point, there are a range of treatment modalities that exist, right? There are different resources that we can access, whether that's seeing a, a, a psychiatrist or a counselor or using group therapy or individual therapy or even medication at times. There are things that exist. There are things that have been proven scientifically, evidence-based mechanisms that help you overcome and deal with your mental health challenges and emotional challenges in a very effective way. So next time we hear something like that, we should all recognize and remember that there are ways that we can maintain our mental well-being. There are ways that we can recover, right? Uh, and once again, I will keep referring back to our tradition and ways that we can understand this through our tradition. So another you know, favorite hadith of mine that I found, seek out cures, O servants of God, for God has placed for every illness a cure except for old age. So when we read something like this, how can we possibly believe that there is no you know, cure or that there is no recovery or that there's no hope for Muslims who are struggling with mental health. Allah has sent down a cure for everything, including, you know, emotional challenges and psychological disorders. So when we deny and when we perpetuate myths like these, misconceptions like these, that there is no chance of recovery, we're going against, you know, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, has told us, that there are cures for this. Uh, there are blessings that we should take advantage of and use to take care of our well-being. Another one of my favorite ayat is, surely it is in the remembrance of Allah that hearts find peace, right? So Allah is showing us once again, you know, remember me, you know, engage in these, in these you know, tools. Uh, so many studies have found that religious coping has really great impacts on mental well-being. So engage in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's trying to show us that, you know, there are ways that we can deal with our mental health challenges by remembering him, by thinking about him. Um, by engaging in religious coping, we may be able to uh, manage and mitigate a lot of our emotional and mental health challenges. So now that we have kind of talked a little bit about different misconceptions and we've deconstructed some of them and looked at the facts, what does it actually look like to struggle with different psychological disorders? What does it look like in Muslims? What are the signs? How do you know when something is just everyday you know, challenges versus something more serious, right? So we're gonna go over a case study that I hope inshallah will be pretty beneficial. And before I bring it up, I just wanna, you know, clarify that no one person will exhibit the same, the same type of symptoms. Like everyone will react to different things differently. So this case study does not apply to the general Muslim population. This is just like an example that we're using to better understand. So let's take Zainab. Zainab is a second year college student. She is feeling overwhelmed while balancing difficult classes and exams, extracurricular activities, and family responsibilities. After a few weeks, Zainab's friends notice she is constantly worried about the future and has difficulty concentrating in her classes. Zainab's family notes that she is experiencing sleep trouble. Her eating habits have changed. She is avoiding gathering with family, friends, and classmates. She is also easily irritated these, these days and has been showing extreme nervousness and unease for the past month. 
Zainab begins attending halaqas at her college and engages in more dhikr, hoping it will solve her difficulties. However, Zainab continues to struggle and finds it more challenging with each day to manage all her responsibilities and health. So let's unpack this. We understand that Zainab is a college student who is feeling overwhelmed. How many of you guys here, how many of you guys are in college here or grad school or anything like that? I think there are a bunch of us here that are in college or a lot of us have been in college at some point. We understand that college is stressful, whether it be college or work. We understand that you will face difficulties, you will face stress from exams and challenges. And so I want to bring up a really key point here. Everyday anxiety is normal, it's healthy. The little bit of anxiety that we need every day keeps us going. It allows us to function, it allows us to take care of our responsibilities. It's normal, but it's when the anxiety, and this is the key, it's when the anxiety starts to elicit physical symptoms. It's when the anxiety starts to get in the way of your everyday routine, everyday life. It's when the anxiety starts to affect your relationships with other people and yourself. That's when we need to take a step back. That's when it becomes a little bit more concerning. It's when you realize that you're not able to tackle your everyday anxiety with the tools that you have. You might need a little bit more help, right? So, that, so here in, in Zainab's example, all of us struggle with you know, classes, exams. All of us you know, have stress levels when it comes to being in college. But what makes this example different? Let's take a look at it. Her friends note that she is constantly worried about the future and has difficulty concentrating in class. She is experiencing sleep trouble. Her eating habits have changed. She is avoiding gatherings. These are all, like physical symptoms that she's experiencing. Extreme nervousness and unease, not just for a day, not just for a couple weeks, but for months at a time, right? So these are clues that are telling us, hey, this is not my everyday anxiety. This is not the little bits of anxiety that I kind of need to get myself going. This is something more serious. It's affecting the way that Zainab is interacting with her friends and families. It's affecting Zainab's physical body. It's affecting her sleep, something that we so desperately need. It's affecting her appetite, something that you know we need to maintain. And so this is just an example for us to realize that we need to be mindful. We need to be mindful of like when we, we are struggling to maintain our well-being and you know how that could uh, call for seeking out professional resources that go beyond just us maintaining through everyday uh, routine switches and whatnot. Uh, the last part that I want to focus on is that Zainab begins attending halakhas at her college and engages in more dhikr. Once again, we're not negating the impact of religious coping and utilizing Islam as a way to maintain your well-being. It's, it's probably the best way that we could maintain our well-being. I think in this example, Zainab should still continue attending the halakas and engage in more dhikr. But here's, the, here's a little bit of the trick here. She should also do that alongside seeking out professional help. She should do that alongside maybe seeing a counselor or someone that could help her. Oftentimes we think that, okay, you know what? Zainab should just keep praying. She should just keep making dhikr. Over time it'll go away, it'll go away. But that's not the reality. The reality is that actually we should stick to our Islamic teachings. We should utilize religious coping, but also supplement it with counseling, uh, therapeutic services, whatever will help us deal with this mental health challenge, right? All right, are you guys ready for another case study? Last one. Okay, inshallah. All right, next case study. Omar is a 45-year-old man with a wife and three kids. He has always been healthy and is well known in the Muslim community for his volunteer efforts and friendly personality. Recently, Umar was unexpectedly laid off from his job and is now experiencing unemployment. While Umar initially worked hard to look for new jobs, his wife notes that Umar is slowly losing hope and blames himself for the layoff. Over the next few months, Umar starts to lose interest in activities he once enjoyed. He no longer wants to play with his kids. He stops attending the masjid and spends most of his time alone. His physical health also begins to worsen. He loses his appetite and experiences significant weight loss, and he is unable to sleep at night for months. His wife believes that Omar has been exposed to the evil eye. She wants Omar to consult with Sheikh at their local mosque and believe this will lead to his recovery. All right, so now that we've digested this information, we are identifying Omar as a 45-year-old man who has just lost his job. So let's take a step back. Losing one's job is a common thing. I'm, it, could, it maybe has happened to someone that you know or has maybe even happened to yourself. And it's a very scary thing. You, know, you are left with uncertainty about your future. You are left with you know, uncertainty about your financial stability. It is a hard thing to grapple with. So having an adverse reaction to it, feeling some sort of sadness or worry is completely normal. It is completely normal, right? 
But just like Zainab's example, what makes this example different? Let's look at it. Umar is beginning to lose interest in activities he once enjoyed. He doesn't want to play with his kids anymore. He stops attending the masjid. This is someone who was so friendly, who volunteered at the masjid, who probably was a loving and supportive father and husband. But suddenly, he's, he stops doing those things. He's spending time in isolation. More importantly, he loses his appetite. He's experiencing significant weight loss, and he is unable to sleep at nights for months. So like we had kind of discussed in the previous slide, it becomes an issue when, the, when your emotional challenges start to affect your everyday functioning. This is definitely affecting his everyday functioning. If he's unable to play with his kids, if he's just isolating himself, if he's not sleeping for months at a time, 100%, it's affecting you know, his function. So this is, once again, we take a step back, we realize, I may not be able to cope with my mental health challenges, I may not be able to utilize the tools, and I may need some more help. I may need to go ask someone else, I may need to seek out resources, right? So, and then the last point that I want to bring up is that Umar, his wife believes that Umar has been exposed to the evil eye. She wants Umar to consult with the sheikh at their local mosque. This is a really important point. We don't deny the effect and impact that evil eye, possession, black magic has on Muslims. Uh, it happens. It's something that maybe someone you know has experienced, right? It's a common thing. We don't deny that. But oftentimes, in the mental health context, it's often over-exaggerated. It's often seen as, this is the only cause. You are depressed because you are possessed. You are depressed because you have experienced some sort of black magic, right? And, you know, it's, it's hard because it, no one factor should be seen as like the main cause, right? This should, it should not be only seen as like, okay, Umar is only dealing with this because he's been affected by the evil eye. It should not be the only cause. If his wife truly believes that he's been exposed to the evil eye, that may be a possibility. If she wants to consult a sheikh at their mosque, that's amazing. She should do that. If she has that resource that she can seek out, why not? But, but, she should also seek out, you know, um, help from maybe a psychiatrist in the field, maybe a mental health counselor. So once again, we kind of saw this with Zainab's example. There's no harm in incorporating, you know, religious coping. There's no harm in bringing in sheikhs into the conversation. It will only enrich a person's recovery and healing because it is holistic. But it needs to be coupled with some sort of professional counseling from either a psychiatrist or a counselor, right? So I hope we've taken some stuff away from Zainab and Omar's example. And my point here is to show you that everyday ordinary Muslims face things like this. This could be a friend of yours. This could be a sibling of yours. So we need to recognize the fact that this happens to us. This, it's not something that we should shy away from. People are struggling, and it's our responsibility to understand that this is happening and how we can help ourselves and those who are struggling. Last slide, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we're gonna bring it home with the slide, and we wanna basically just give you guys um, a bunch of resources that you can access. We want to show you guys how to take care of your mental well-being. Um, if you, and I know you guys already know, but this is just a little bit of more, uh, you know, like more detailed guide, I guess. But before I go into that, I want us to all reflect on a moment. When was the last time you experienced some physical symptoms? Maybe you had a fever. Maybe you experienced pneumonia. Maybe you broke your arm. When was that last time? Think about it in your head. What was the first thing you did? The first thing you did was probably, I need to go to the doctors. I need to go get my fever checked out. Maybe I need to take my antibiotics to you know, deal with my fever. I have a broken bone, okay. I need to listen to the doctor. I need to put it in a cast, right? We are so quick to take care of our physical symptoms, our physical ailments right away, right? But sometimes we are slow to do that with our mental well-being, right? We may not, we may neglect this. Oh, you know what, I, I'm, I'm feeling anxious for months, but you know, it'll go away, it'll go away. Uh, you know, I might have to go to counseling, I might have to take certain medications. No, I don't think I'll do that. But we're so quick to take care of our physical symptoms. Our bodies are an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are a gift. We need to take care of them. But so are our minds and, and brains. We also need to take care of that as well. So I, you know, we, let's talk a little bit about how do we do that. I think a lot of the times people want to step up. People want to take care of their mental health, but they don't really know where to go for resources. They don't know what resources are free. So let's talk through them. And I really hope that you guys stay attentive during this last slide because this could be really beneficial for either you or someone else that you know who is struggling. First off, community and university, chap university chaplains. IOK is amazing in the sense that it has community chaplains. How many of you guys knew that? Okay, a good amount of people. There are, uh, Sheikh Farhan is one of our chaplains and Sister Sara, who is a counselor, she is also one of the chaplains. Free 20 minute sessions. 
for anyone to just come, get advice, talk about whatever challenges that they have. How amazing is that? For free. Utilize the resource. Utilize this resource. I'm not going to go through all the links, but I would hope that you guys could look on the IOK website and find the chaplaincy tab, and you will see community chaplaincy. You can sign up for a slot uh, during any week. So this is an amazing opportunity. If you're not ready to see a therapist, maybe, but if you just want to have a conversation with someone, if you want to get advice on maybe a problem that you're having with your spouse, maybe stress that you're experiencing in academics, these two people are great resources to go to, so take advantage of them. Next up, all of the students here in college, you guys are blessed to have amazing chaplains that are facilitated through IOK. UCLA, UC Riverside, uh, Cal State, all the Cal States, I'm pretty sure, um, UC Irvine, amazing scholars. And guess what? They're also available for certain consultations and counseling. They're available to listen to you, to, to, get, uh, to hear your advices. And they're also trained. So let's say they can't handle something that maybe you're dealing with. I promise you, they will direct you to someone who can. So please take care, uh, please utilize that resource. Ask your MSA. For those of you who don't know, reach out to your MSA tonight. Find out who the chaplain is, when their office hours are, and book them. These are free resources, and these are trained counselors and trained chaplains that are here to help you. Next up, mental health trained religious leaders. It's no surprise that a lot of us feel comfortable going to our local sheikhs. You know, uh, many, maybe many of you guys might feel comfortable going to Sheikh Barhan. Maybe he's someone that you guys have uh, grown up around. Maybe he's someone that you feel comfortable sharing your struggles with. That's also great. Another amazing thing that IOK is doing is they're training their religious leaders in mental health first aid. So when you go to Sheikh Farhan or another Sheikh, Sheikh Zaid, Sheikh Mudathir, they will be able to direct you to resources. They will be able to show you, well, this is where you can get counseling. Well, this is where you can see a psychiatrist, right? So take advantage of your religious leaders uh, in your community spaces, such as IOK. Another opportunity for seeking out help, counselors and therapists. Uh, that is a really good avenue. We've been kind of talking about it throughout the session, but I want to pinpoint a couple of different centers. The Khalil Center, the number one provider for Muslim mental health in the United States. The Khalil Center is located in Northridge, California, and it uses an Islamic psychology approach to counseling. Uh, and all of their therapists, I believe, are Muslim. Um, and they provide individual counseling, marital counseling, family counseling. Once again, I'm not going to take, I, I don't think we have time for me to click through the links. But if you go to Khalil Center and search up our services, you can easily uh, book a consultation. They work with your insurance companies. Um, they're able to offer discounts. So please utilize that as a resource. Another amazing thing that's out there, Madistan, another uh, psychological and spiritual well-being center opened up in NorCal, but they do provide virtual consultations. So feel free to look them up as well. One of my favorite things is a SoCal therapist directory. Say you're in Hawthorne or Culver City and you're like, I need a Muslim therapist, where do I look? Use this handy dandy directory, type in your address and it will show you the closest therapist near you. This is a great resource if you're looking for a Muslim therapist. This is if you feel comfortable and you feel like you would benefit more from a Muslim therapist. So uh, also look into that directory. ICNA Relief Crescent Counseling Center, Counseling Center in Roland Heights and Counseling Center in Fullerton. Free counseling offered on Saturdays and Sundays as well as a couple days during the week. I don't want to misspeak so that's something that you guys could look up. But those are also free services, free services, individual counseling services that can help you navigate different challenges that uh, you can talk to trusted people that are trained to help you deal with these things. Ihsan Coaching, just another platform, uh, provides one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, marital coaching, uh, personal coaching, family coaching, uh, what have you. There are a lot of resources on there. Also, you can uh, book online consultations, and I believe they will work with your insurance or provide financial assistance. Uh, almost at the end, um, this is also, let's say, you know, you need a certain you need something diagnosed or you need to seek out certain medication or you feel like maybe a psychiatrist would better fit your needs at that moment in time for whatever emotional challenge or psychological disorder that you are struggling with. And if you want a Muslim psychiatrist, the Khalil Center also has a Muslim psychiatrist that you can uh, reach out to and book sessions with. Last thing, 
Uh, if you're someone who just wants to learn more about you know, Muslim mental health, Islamic psychology, if you want to read resources, research papers, uh, videos, check out the Yaqeen Institute. They have some really great articles. Um, they have some great collaborations with other speakers. Um, the Stanford University Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, which is a lab that I research at, also does really amazing work. We do everything from looking at suicide rates in Muslim communities. We do everything from working with religious leaders on how to tackle substance abuse in Muslim communities. We research refugee, global mental health, um, Islamic psychology, and Dr. Rani Awad leads this, uh, leads this research lab. Lots of research papers, lots of presentations. Um, so seek, like, uh, you know, check these websites out, check these different institutions and labs out, and if you want to educate yourself more and learn about them, these are great places to go. And lastly, Institute for Social Policy and Research also has like a mental health toolkit for leaders to utilize. Um, so yeah, that brings us to the end of our presentation. I just want to end by saying that, you know, I really appreciate you guys all coming out and being so receptive. And just remember that, you know, while mental health is very much an individual journey, it's also a community health challenge. So we as a community need to make sure that we are looking out for each other. If there's someone that you didn't see in the crowd tonight, if there's someone that you know is struggling, it's also your duty to you know, um, help them. It's our duty to look out for another. So take care of yourselves. Don't neglect your mental well-being. Don't neglect your mental health. Your mental health is a priority, just like your physical health. And I hope that's something that, if that's the only thing you take away from this talk, then that be it. Jazakallah khair. You took that bull by the horns. <laughs> oh, also, we have, oh wait, sorry, one more thing, please. <laughs> please <laughs> fill out this feedback form. We really want to know how you guys enjoyed this talk, if you guys feel like you learned things, and if you want to see more of this at IOK, um, please, 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 and we will have, we will open up the floor to any questions. <laughs> You guys are making it too easy for us. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, yes. Do you want to take that? <laughs> I can add on to it. Yeah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, that's an excellent question. I think uh, the point that, um, that Huma was trying to make was it's about reframing, right? So she was making a general statement. Um, but what happens is, is like that wouldn't be the first thing that you say to somebody that's suffering. Right? That's just something that you might add on if it's something that they just can't overcome. Right? So it's just reframing. Um, but of course, if somebody comes to you and they're suffering with something, it might be physical, social, psychological, even spiritual, um, you, know, you have to do those supportive interventions that we talked about first. You have to listen. You have to understand the person. And then you have to evaluate whether that statement is even relevant. But what she was, you know, what I understood from, from what she was saying is that it's just an opportunity to reframe it for the person. Because if somebody doesn't, you know, it, it, it could possibly be that, right? There's the, she just gave you one hadith. There's a lot of hadith like that, you know, where, you know, when Allah SWT want to raise your spiritual degree, you know, he ibtilahum, he gives them trials and tribulations. There's, there's quite a few hadith about that, right? But that's not the first thing that you say to someone. That might be the last thing that you say to them to give them hope. Oh, possibly, right? Like this could be from uh, the love of Allah, you know? But uh, that, that was what I understood. Yeah. Okay. Can I clarify Yeah. Oh, I see. 
Yeah, that's a whole different issue right there. Um, um, and so, again, right, um, you know, in general, yeah, I would, I, you know, even in general, like not speaking as a therapist, um, you know, you, you have to explain to that person that, um, you know, seeking help is actually sunnah, right? <laughs> like, you know, seek help. And there's many examples where even, you know, Rasulullah was told to seek counsel. I mean, he's Rasulullah but he was told to take the counsel of his companions when making a decision, right? Or, um, you know, when there's nushus, when there's, you know, fighting between the husband and wife, Allah says, you know, take someone from her family, take someone from his family, right? Like, don't try to negotiate that all by yourself. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I, that, that's how I would approach it, even with, without, you know, being a therapist. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Make dua for us. Yes. Yes. Jazakallah khairan. Yes, so she was, she was just saying that there's another organization out of Canada, Nasiha. I'm also very familiar with them. Um, alhamdulillah, they do good work too. <coughs> Anyone else? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, um, first of all, you know, right, like, um, I, I, w I would encourage them to, like, like learn their deen first, right? I, I, that, like, I'm just being honest, like, learn your deen first. Learn the principles of Islam first before you go through that. If that's not possible, then I would tell them, well, then become a clinical social worker, right? It's the same degree but it's not so much of that psychological you know, uh, uh, stuff. You know? They're telling you not only how to change the inner world of a person, but they're also trying, they also help you to understand how to change their environment. And in the end, it's, it's, you, know, um, you, you both become licensed therapists. So uh, that's what I would say. Now, if a person is going on to become a doctor, right, to get their PhD or something like that, and they just have to go through it, I would say, be very careful, learn your dean first. And I'm saying it's like firsthand experience. Like I, you know, I'm, all, I'm on this chat with like oh, almost 300 Muslim therapists all across the world, not just in America, but across the world. And I can tell right away the ones who studied and the ones who didn't. I can tell right away. So yeah, that, that's, that would be my advice. Anyone else? Assalamu alaikum. Ali, you. See, see, we have to remove the biological condition, right? <laughs> so that it doesn't become psychologically stressful. <laughs> All right. Alhamdulillah. So uh, I'll let the staff, I'll let them answer that question, inshallah. <laughs> they can also leave questions on the form if they think of them later. Okay, she said that you can also leave questions on the form. The, the, you know, uh, when you scan that it, and the form pops up, you can leave questions there also. So that looks like that's it. MashaAllah. 
سبحان الله وبحمده نشر ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين رحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Keep a lookout for our family nights, inshallah. We'll probably have uh, events most likely once a month, inshallah. And uh, as he was mentioning, for anyone who is going into this field of psychology or studying and you want a solid grounding in your deen, I will send them in, inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> the plug. The plug. <laughs> 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 <laughs>